Hello everybody and welcome to Heritage Hour. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm Trigger Douglas, Program Coordinator with the Department of Heritage Services. It's a pleasure to see all of you here today. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The City of Kingston acknowledges that we are on the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and huron wendat and thanks these nations for their care and stewardship over this shared land. For those of you who are new to Heritage Hour, this is a bi-monthly series which focuses on different aspects of local history and culture. Talks run approximately an hour and there may be time for questions at the end. Today we are very lucky to be learning from Heidi Greenmeyer, the Executive Director of the Museum of Toronto. She has over two decades of experience working in visual arts institutions around the world, holding positions at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Museum of Contemporary Art Toronto, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. She has led public programming and learning departments at the Vancouver Art Gallery, Tate Gallery, and the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, and produced radio for the BBC. She returned home four years ago and has joined Myzeum with a passion to grow the organization. Myzeum originated the iconic exhibition 36 Questions That Lead to Loving Toronto, which provided interactive opportunities for Torontonians to express their thoughts and feelings about the city. Thanks to a collaborative partnership between the City of Kingston and Myzeum, a local version of this exhibition is now available right here in City Hall. After Heidi's talk, we invite all of you to visit 36 Questions That Lead to Loving Kingston. Please join me in welcoming Heidi to the stage. Do I have to use this mic? We're a small group, so I'm wondering. Nope, I'm going to put it down. Um, yeah, thank you. So thank you very much for having me today. I think we can have a really um, deep conversation about 36 questions and certainly around how one thinks through museums. That is my kind of area of expertise. And um, in the last two years working with a museum, which its registered name is Museum of Toronto Histories. Um, so thinking through the idea of how do you build a civic museum? Toronto, unlike Kingston, doesn't have a uh, city museum. It has heritage museums in heritage buildings, but it doesn't have a city museum that in a sense explores contemporary issues and contemporary questions through history. So we originated with that ambition in that plan. The organization is about eight years old and I'll walk you through a little bit around myself, my history, more so around museums, how they've changed a little really quick and brusque travel through the history of museums, and then a deeper dive into 36 questions and some of the things we've learned, and then maybe a conversation about how we might use this material that we've generated for 36 questions. So, oh, I have a controller, and it's like being at home. So I, as uh, Taylor mentioned, thank you for the intro, Taylor. Um, have worked in many, um, I would say, more monolithic organizations, not uh, an organization as nimble or small. I've worked in some of those iconic institutions that we recognize as being um, the kind of pillars of museum life. Um, museums, as many of you know, really started out as cabinets of curiosity. In the 16th century, collectors um, built new collections that were really in drawers and cases and other places. And as time progressed, they became more systematic and more ordered. These um, collections, in a sense, became known as cabinets of curiosity across Europe, uh, and in particular in England. Um, during the 18th century, some private collections opened. The British Museum was established in 1753, the Museum in Castle in 1779, and the Uffizi in Florence. Um, this idea of those European capitals and monarchs actually opening the doors of their collection, individuals opening the doors of their collection, um, became a kind of premise of public building and public access. So this is the Louvre, which in the, um, by the end of the 19th century was um, uh, the Louvre in, sorry, the 17th century was the first building to open to the public and was the first kind of public collection that we can think about. Um, museums, though, really remained and continue to remain closely tied to scholarly research and that idea of learning. 
they were tools in a sense of power and gaining power amongst many people, you know, the, the plebs, if you like, but certainly in America with private individuals funding galleries. That was one of the early premises was this idea of how do we teach um, of culture, of tradition, of etiquette, of behavior. How do we bestow on those that are not of the same class as ours that idea of what aesthetics might mean or what beauty is? So it's this idea of cultural supremacy that is a thread um, running through and embodied within museums. I think, though, that my work has never, I've never been particularly interested in that. Um, my work has always really been about that idea of not in the service of the object, but in the service of the audience. So how do you take a museum or museum that has this traditional DNA rooted within it, which is very much about this idea, it's certainly in visual arts museums and in science museums, encyclopedic museums, they're often called um, encyclopedias that have large gaps in them if we think about collections, but encyclopedic museums, how do we think through um, a way in which built into the organization is this idea of audience? and the visitor. Um, I once had a conversation with a curator who, I, this is my favorite line, who said, well, the exhibition is on the walls. It doesn't really matter if the door is open. <laughs> um, so in their mind, that idea of the exhibition being the fate, you know, the, the finished, the complete uh, experience. And in my mind, there is no experience without audience. So, terrible slide on the left, but my work is always, always, and I predominantly specialize in adult engagement, but large scale, like large scale engagement, small scale engagement, but that idea of public discourse, the idea of unpicking or unraveling the museum has been foundational to a lot of the work I've done. Um, and it's not so much in a lot of the current and contemporary debates, and we can talk a little bit about this, about destabilizing the museum. I'm. I'm a lover of museums, so in a way I don't want them blown up. Um, I, I, I don't feel they should be blown up, but I do feel they need a kind of radical rethinking of how the curators are often the superstars and how the objects are often seen as the thing that is more important or the important. And we, I mean, many of you know, it's part of the economic system of museums in, in contemporary museums when you have limited funders who are coming in, limited donors who are coming in, there is inequity in how the power works inside museums. And contemporary museums' relationship to the contemporary market, contemporary visual arts, I can talk for hours, um, there is a very, very um, clear route between contemporary museums and the contemporary um, art market. And that also purports many difficulties or problems, but working inside museums to think through how people are, they animate, they create knowledge, they generate knowledge. So even if it's children dancing, this is from the Vancouver Art Gallery, but even if it's an invitation for children to engage with a dance group that may have used a picture as a reference point to create a performance, there is meaning that's being generated in that moment. And there's also a system of exchange. The top right is Tate, and it's a pretty straightforward um, slide of someone doing a gallery talk and speaking through a work in the collections. But I've done work where um, I did a project with an artist called Martin Creed, where we actually hired actors and we brought together um, Gertrude Stein and Warhol to have a conversation about Rousseau which makes no sense at all if you're thinking historically, but we actually have people coming into the galleries thinking it was a real talk. Oh, Gertrude Stein is here. Um, so taking characters from very historical periods to talk through a painting from a different historical period. So I'm very interested in the way you trouble history, but also the way you can create these collisions around history for visitors to make new sorts of meanings. Museums have come under attack. They've come under attack for the inequity. They've come under attack for hiring policies, they've come under attack for funding, they've come under attack for not doing enough around social justice or, or social change. Um, so museums have become a critical point in where and what should be happening within them, what they own, what they collect, how they collect, who works for them, who funds them. 
Um, but ultimately, they are places where visitors can connect and convene. And I think that's the thing to remember and um, really hang on to. So Myzeum, as Taylor mentioned, um, ironically is funded by a, predominantly a single funder at the moment. Part of the remit is to expand that um, premise. But the idea is how do you create a civic in this climate? How do you create a civic museum? How do you create, and what is a museum ultimately? I mean, that becomes a question in and of itself. ICOM, the International Committee of Museums, has just moved forward with a new definition, and they talk about tangible and intangible objects. They talk about communities making meaning. So you no longer have this idea of the single authority, the museum curator or the museum uh, director being the authority of knowledge. And I like to say the museum, those that work within museums, we hold expertise, but we don't hold authority. And I think that's a really clear uh, demarcation between the skill set that you bring um, to your audience and also the audiences are bringing their own expertise into an exchange. I think it's really important to remember that. So Diane Blake and Stephen Smith with her husband in 2014 actually registered the Museum of Toronto Histories with an ambition that Toronto requires a city museum. And you know, Toronto is incredibly diverse, it, millions of people live there, it continues to grow. So the idea of how do you create a museum that brings people together, and that's ultimately what civic museums should do. Um, so the first place I started was thinking through staffing. We have a very different staffing, partially we're diverse as a group, um, but also very few people in our group hold museum expertise. So I hired outside the sector. I work with people who, um, like Davin, his digital, digital content comes from LA. He used to work on an extreme sport channel. Um, Rosemary in marketing and social media came from the commercial sector. So I have a majority, I have a significant number of people who are moving from the commercial sector and a significant number of people, Bria has a degree in fashion, <clears throat> in fashion. So it's really thinking through, um, Sarah used to work in dance, so it was thinking through how do we bring together a group of people who maybe don't already have some of the limitations that I have about what you can and cannot do. Um, we also are very, very committed to this idea of working in collaboratively and working with partners. Again, we don't hold all the expertise, and so one of the things is that I don't, we don't have traditional curators that hold knowledges in that way that you might have somebody who has a 16th century knowledge or 17th century. What we do is we source out that expertise. So we're working with journalists, historians, um, lawyers, uh, urban planners, architects, to think through ways in which their stories about Toronto and some of the questions that we want to raise about Toronto are uh, coming from different places. And what we bring is the expertise around how do you create an exhibition, how do you create a public program, how do you create... So a lot of our conversations about strategies, how do you create a sense of welcome, a sense of warm, how do you bring audiences together, how do you host a public talk and people can feel like it's a safe space, they feel like they can talk. So we talk a lot about sociability. Statistically, um, 90, I think it's something like 80% of audiences who go to tr traditional museums go in pairs. Um, people go to have a good time and they go to learn something new. There's a great study, you probably all know it, which is Culture Track. They do it every couple of years. Um, and uh, the Placa Cohen put that out. They've done a Canadian similarly researching what people want from their cultural experiences. We really are thinking about that idea of social cohesion and one of the gaps or one of the strategic kind of mandates for us is how do you begin to measure that? That's a huge kind of conversation and question if you're in the museum field. I don't know how you measure it, but our mandate really is thinking through relationships, sense of belonging, participation, and orientation towards a common goal. These are all factors when we curate or when we put together um, a, uh, a program and then really creating trust amongst our community. We work in three spaces. So that's the other thing that maybe is a bit unusual is we do have bricks and mortar 
that's new. It's only two years old and I was hired when the organization um, secured some bricks and mortar, super small. Uh, it's only 2,000 square foot. We are, uh, there is an ambition to have a smaller space. Um, I'm not so keen about building from the ground up, but we'll see whether or not the board is keen on digging a big hole and thinking through. So our space is top right. It's in 401 Richmond, which is, um, if you're in Toronto, you'll know it. It's a kind of arts building that's been there for 40 years, maybe, um, subsidized by a philanthropist. And it's a space with lots of galleries and lots of cultural organizations. We work around the city. This is a project we did at the Bank Way. We did 36 questions pop up, but we also did this small city building project. Um, you can see people building bits of cities with, and we work really, really heavily and successfully online. So I'm going to show you some of the storytelling that we do online. We really think about the work that we do as storytelling. That's what museums do. You create narratives, and those narratives' history is storytelling. History changes all the time and is not absolute, it is not stable, so we really think about the idea of transforming history. 36 questions that lead to love in Toronto, then we actually up in 10 of Toronto, which was can 10 neighborhoods define who you are? And then most recently we had a very successful show with Mr. Dress Up to Degrassi, 42 years of legendary television. Um, we are citywide programs. We do something called sidewalk stories, which are participatory walking tours. We're trying to trouble the idea of what does it mean when you go on a walking tour and you're in public space. Black Diaspora is a program we're doing with Afro Urban in New York. They are collecting 50, 100 stories, over 100 stories um, from the black community. So we have uh, community organizers who are then interviewing community members. Uh, and then inviting young filmmakers to create films from those stories. And that's a geomap. They've done it in Melbourne and they've done it in New York, so we're going to do it in Toronto. And 52 uh, is Stories of Women Who Transformed Toronto. It's a project we just launched. Um, and we are working with the idea of 52 women who have been chosen uh, through a matrix system, which many of you can talk about another time or after. Um, commissioned 52 play monologues by 28 playwrights and the idea is it's a full-length performance. For Nuit Blanche, which is when Toronto opens late, they do a program from 7 till 7 um, across the city. We actually invited members of the public to step into the shoes of 52 women. So what we did was set up a camera, set up a screen, set up two stages, set up many cameras and we had 10,000 people who read 30 second monologues of the month. So they read 30 seconds from the three minute monologues. And you would stand up and say, hi, I'm Heidi Reitmeyer. I'm stepping into the shoes of Adrian Clarkson. And then you would read a bit about Adrian Clarkson's life. And we had no restrictions on who spoke. So we had, uh, we had a lot of men stepping into the shoes of a lot of women. We had some fantastic older women stepping into the shoes of Jackie Shane, who's a, um, an activist, trans, and in that script there was a lot of swearing, so that was very amusing. Uh, we had some donors who were really loving the F word, um, so they kind of got into it. But it was a great way to really think about how you activate the city in different ways. It will then be an exhibition, we're filming the monologues, and a performance piece. Um, I think because I, I don't think I can show them because I think we downloaded it. So I don't know if they're active. Are they active? Um, I'm not I sure. I think if I made it a PDF, they're not. Would you like me to try to? Do you want to try to show one? You do the Toronto City Hall. Let's see, let's see. Um, so one of our huge commitments is how do you, okay. Um, is how you begin to story tell online. We have been huge advocates on TikTok and Instagram. We have gone, now we have more followers on TikTok than the ROM and the EGO. We've had 5.5, over 5 million impressions this year. It's over. Okay. It's on your screen. Oh, it's on my screen. I'm sorry, yeah. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you can see some of the storytelling that we do. We do these one minute uh, quick and fast history stories. Um, and 
this is, but they're called Did You Know? So go ahead. You know that Toronto's new mayor will have more power than any mayor elect in the city's history. Bill 39, which passed in the Legislative Assembly of Ontario in December of 2022, a few months before former mayor John Tory resigned, provides increased powers to the incoming mayor. This bill, groundbreaking for the city, allows the mayor to pass legislation, reorganize the city departments, hire and fire department heads, and appoint a city manager, all without majority council approval. Most significantly, this means the mayor can propose and pass city bylaws with only one-third council approval. Some suggest that this could provide a road to quickly dealing with the needs of the city as it grows. It might align with provincial priorities, opening the door to greater resources. Could these new powers provide the mayor with the ability to accelerate such things as housing development? This shift, however, hasn't been without controversy. Former Toronto mayors Art Eggleton, David Crombie, Barbara Hall, David Miller, and John Sewell have all labeled the bill as undemocratic. So as we watch this new chapter unfold, for good or bad, it's clear the future of Toronto and the growth of our city will very well be shaped by these heightened mayoral powers. Um, so this is an example of something when we think about museums in terms of social change um, and uh, kind of social engagement, we had a really long conversation about how to present this material. Um, of course, everyone in the staff was, it's horrible, it's a bad idea, we have to take these powers away from the mayor. So we had a lot of conversations, it was really interesting about what is our responsibility as an organization or as a museum. Museums are not neutral, like that's the hard reality. They are rooted, deeply rooted politically, whether it be through their funding, through their collections, through those that work there, through personal values. But how do you begin to create an organization where the personal values of the individuals who work there, the personal values which are vast and broad of your constituency and your responsibility as an organization, where do you find and how do you find the balance? So that's been a really interesting conversation for us um, around like what do we deem inappropriate, what do we deem problematic, where are we willing to you know, not accept money or how do we um, navigate this plane of money. And so, you know, I was, we're talking about expanding the board and I'm saying we need somebody from other parties and the staff is like, no, God forbid. And you're like, actually you have to, Think about how you navigate an incredibly complex in Canada, not as bad as the States, but an incredibly complex landscape. So the did you know is about the Mariel powers when it was written, I had a look at it and I was like, it's completely biased. We're just simply saying it's rubbish. Isn't there anyone who's gonna say that these are good things? Like could Olivia Chow sort of veto the five days that it takes for the five years that it takes for developers or whomever? to actually process building? Could she not just say, you know what, I'm gonna wave a wand and affordable housing is gonna happen. Like, you know, is there ever a moment that we can imagine where those might be used, in our opinion, as, as good? So it's one of the questions we have around, like how do you begin to kind of include the voices of your audience and, and what are your responsibilities? So 36 questions that lead to Loving Toronto was the first uh, project that we launched and it was moving beyond that idea of not just capturing the feelings of Torontonians but actually we launched it in this kind of blithe and slightly naive way of what happens if we ask visitors what they want the museum to talk about like what are the concerns of our audience in Toronto what is really important to people and how are we going to use that information if we're talking about building the city so it originated from the Experimental Generation of Interpersonal Closeness, which was a paper published in 97 by the psychologist Arthur Aaron. And this idea is that you have 36 questions. You ask these 36 questions of anyone, a stranger, a lover, a friend. And through this process, you will become more intimate with that person. Your relationship will deepen. So the idea is you go from the most generic questions like, what color do you like? Or how was your morning? You know, what was your favorite thing you did this morning? to a deep question, a question like what's made you sad or when do you not feel safe? That idea that you take someone through a journey which is from the most kind of blithe like chit chat to kind of more intimate. We decided to turn those questions onto the city, which isn't a kind of new idea. It had been done by some other organizations, but it hadn't been done in a kind of literal translation. 
So the first thing we did was actually work with an interpretive planner, a woman called Judy Koch, who is uh, a museum professional and has worked inside museums for decades and for about three hours to turn around these questions. <laughs> but she took these 36 questions and we had divided them into six sections. And the first section is finding a map. So what food best represents Toronto? If the CN Tower was removed, what building or structure would you want to be the symbol of the city? Um, Roti's one, dumplings one, patties one. I thought dumplings were gonna win. So my theory on dumplings, do you wanna hear my theory on dumplings? Is that they're, they're more transcultural. So like more uh, uh, communities have dumplings than any other community. So I was going dumplings, right? Cause I just thought, oh, everyone loves dumplings. But no, Roti's one. Um, new complete me was, you know, what are those Toronto things that people say? The most interesting thing is about Toronto, and these are some of our answers, and I'll get to, I have some um, findings from the report. The other thing that we did, so we launched the program, and in the middle of this exhibition, we didn't do this very systematically, we're going to be more systematic in the future. In the middle of this program, we were like, we should take it on the road. So we built a pop-up, which I'll talk a bit about, but we also thought we should be collecting all this data. Like, what are we doing with all these answers? And we have subsequently um, gathered over now 40,000 data points, um, and I think it's like 25,000 people have taken part in this. Second is playing Cupid. We create these hearts, you can stab them. Um, they are here as well. Uh, floating heart represents the question, what adjective would you best use to address? the city, name one thing that makes Toronto unique. Here are some of our uh, playing Cupid, heart marks the spot. This was a map using flags. Each colored flag represents a different uh, question. And this is where you can see the questions become a little bit more, um, they're asking you to think a little bit more. It's not just a roti or dumplings. It's like, what's the most undervalued place in the city? Or what's one place in don't feel safe. So this was uh, our Google documents and pins. You can see it's a fairly significant cross-section of the city, uh, people from all across Toronto. The love line was asking people to leave a message about their most treasured memory, terrible Toronto memory, time Toronto disappointed you, something you long dreamed of. Um, and uh, I won't play these, but these are like voicemails that have left. They're very beautiful. And then Dear Toronto, we're uh, asking people to write a love letter and they can put it in the mailbox. So you are my son, you are where I've learned so much about who I am and who I want to be, but I need you to be better. I need you to be able to afford my home, connect with my community in an accessible way, and be who I am fearlessly because I love you, Toronto continue to work to make you better. Like really, really heartfelt, beautiful letters from people about what they're pained about the city and amplifying the city, right? Really thinking about it as a person, as someone they're having a relationship with. And that is really what we wanted to do, is begin to think about people's relationship to the city, their affinity and their love. So here it is um, in Kingston, uh, actually the picture but um, it's now in Houston. We also, like I said, took it on the road. So we had 36 question pop-ups in 2022, and we had to adopt the uh, project. So this piece where you can see these little kids, these are either ors. So would you choose the maple leaves over the raptors? Do you think Drake is underrated or overrated? Have a guess. <laughs> Have a guess. What do most Torontonians think of Drake? And who wins, raptors or maple leaves? I'll show you what we went. Raptors. Raptors. Yeah. Raptors, which was very fascinating. Nice. So we then had huge success in 2022. So we were invited to actually do our pop-up at the CNE, the Toronto International Film Festival, Tasting of Antwerp and Toronto After Art Fair. All places where we would never imagine that we would actually physically be. So really, in um, the CNE, we saw like 4,000 people a day. It was completely insane. So 50,000 people have engaged. 3,000 people have answered all of the 36 questions. 
we now actually have a few more data points than 30,000. What? Amazing. It's amazing. So we work with Nology, who are a collection of scientists and writers and educators who are interested in untangling social issues to do a bit of a deep dive in the work. So inferring from, inferring from the letters, we think we've seen recent arrivals, tourists, students, long-term residents, people who used to live in Toronto. We had a lot of people who moved out, um, suburbanites and the ex-urbanites. Most people in Toronto are, and this is a kind of a map of our findings, um, that most people in Toronto, and probably you get a higher count rate in Kingston, I would think that Kingston wouldn't necessarily be weird or uh, inconsiderate. I don't know, are people in Kingston nicer, busy, fast-paced? People in Toronto are tired and stressed, overworked. So um, one of the really interesting things that we took away that we never imagined was this relationship to nature and green space. That Torontonians have a really strong affinity with a city that is embedded in green space and the green space is not parks so much but also ravines the hidden secrets of toronto if anyone's lived there or lives there i've just come back after five years after like i don't know many many decades away i'm discovering the ravine system in a way um, and the thing that people love is also the thing they want people to be more concerned with but it's also the things they hate so um, nature, they love and they hate. They wish people cared more about it. They love multiculturalism. They wish people cared more about it. And they don't love housing. Um, it was the big. But diversity, multiculturalism, community, people, and food were what people defined as the most interesting thing. Um, so again, Toronto in one adjective, diverse. Di this question of diversity kept coming up over and over again, multiculturalism, community, and food. So I think for us, what became fascinating was um, thinking through how this material can not only inform programs, but can really think about how we shape a museum. So thinking through staffing, our board, what we actually speak of, but also what kind of experience. If we're to open a museum, if we're to really think physically, food was one of the huge priorities. So I'm now thinking through, well, what happens if every time we do an event, we have a food truck? Or we think about a food truck as being essential. We actually amalgamate some of our programming with food. Um, so it's this idea as well of not thinking so much about a museum as being representative of, but the idea of the museum being experiential, that you are rooted somehow in the experience, that you're not a passive observer in something that occurs, but you are a participant in how you make that meaning or make that knowledge. I think my years of working inside traditional museums, and I know people do, and I love walking through a museum and just looking at a painting and being quiet and having that contemplative moment, but to think through a city museum is like how do you create an environment or a possibility where you have a kind of, I wouldn't say co-creation because that steers into a way where your visitors are helping you build an exhibition. Um, and I think one of the things I'm very interested in is how do we work as the connector between our knowledge or expertise that we have, um, the audiences who want a particular kind of experience and a huge body of knowledge that um, we know in our community is held. So I'll give you an example. Our next exhibition is on sport. We're working with a sports commentator who wrote for the Toronto Star for 12, 15 years and also now works for the CBC and a public historian and they're doing our sport exhibition. We're doing, um, another thing we took away was, so here you go, undervalued places. Nature is super undervalued, neighborhoods are very undervalued, food drinks are undervalued. Um, and the specific locations, Scarborough Bluffs, Tommy Thompson, Don Valley, uh, Rouge Park, they're all um, ravines. So we're doing a summer of green. This has actually informed us. Next summer, we're doing something called the summer of green 
where we're programming all around nature. We're doing uh, an exhibition called Toronto Gone Wild. I'm trying to convince the curators to actually do an inverted diorama that you can walk into. Um, so you trouble the idea of the historic, archeological, or ethnographic. Um, because the other thing that is enormously um, popular, so these beloved stories, you had them and they kept coming up over and over again, were unclear about how we might use these. Um, but what we do know is that there is a community of people, we also know there's a community of people, huge community of people, who are interested in the history of the city. When I first got the job, there was an idea of history is boring. I can't believe you're going from an art museum into a, this idea of building a civic museum. History is really, really, really boring. And what I'm discovering is that history, histories are not boring. Um, and also, generationally, the, uh, our audience is 18 to 45. So we have this really an incredibly diverse uh, community of people who are really, really interested in the work that we're doing. Um, so this idea of how people register the city as a place where they feel like they belong. So these are some of the kind of thematics that we're thinking through, but also what we're doing is holding on to this to think about how we can begin to talk about value. If you go back to that idea of connection and sharing community, one of the issues, I think I had a slide, but I probably took it out. One of the issues inside museums is how do you actually make an argument for the value? of what museums do. So there's this idea of, oh, you generate tourism, you generate revenue, you're about economic development. And we know that often economic development and tourism and culture end up in the same place, or sport and tourism and culture end up in the same place. But what we know is that culture does something else. It does generate a sense, placemaking does generate the sense of shared connection of the idea of curiosity and affinity and that curiosity that museums or cultural experiences create also allow people to ask difficult questions you know it's foundational to democracy i'm going to get all high level on you but i mean it is foundational to how we think through how we treat each other some of those civic questions and how we live and have a sense of being part of a community these are some things that torontonians are most disappointed and it was interesting in a way that um, working with Americans they were shocked that there was um, there wasn't a lot of things about violence there wasn't a lot of about health care and there wasn't a lot about education so their take was oh my god if you did this in New York City it would still be housing but it would be education and health care would be the other big big and police brutality violence um, so our dreams are really the ambition of owning a home, starting a business, connecting, spending more time in nature, affordability, lack of time or access, intimidation in the pandemic were all sort of limitations. Um, but again, this idea of Toronto being a real person. this sense of bringing in nature. So we also wanted to know from people what would make them leave. And um, again, not education, not police brutality, not um, lack of health care, because those are all within our kind of social frameworks of our cities. Affordability, uh, winter, which you can't control. Um, the community and affordability, and poor political leadership. And the last thing I just wanted to uh, point out, we also asked a question, if you were to write a book on Toronto, what would be the first three chapters that you would write? Um, because we began to think about, okay, what would we want if we were doing an exhibition, if we we're opening up a new space, with multiple spaces, tourist guide of the neighborhood, what they personally loved about the city, personal experiences in the history of Toronto, and raccoons. Raccoons came up over and over and over again. I don't know whether the same obsession is evident here in Kingston, but certainly raccoons.
raccoons were, they came out, they were drawn, they were written, they were animated, but raccoons were one of the biggest. Um, so what we're doing with this material is thinking through how we transform our program, how we think about our value systems or how we begin to think about our values and how we're gonna define a system for um, measuring that value, thinking through that notion of trust and connectivity. And then also thinking what are some of the hard issues that we wanna tackle and how do we tackle those in a sort of a broad and more uh, inclusive mode. So it's really it's how do you build a museum that connects people and creates a kind of social cohesion. Um, and this project was the beginning of the exploration of that, leading from a lot of the earlier work um, that we had done. So, there's my talk. Is that 40 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say you know, like, a very, very sincere thank you. It's been a real pleasure learning from you and having you here today. And your work is so interesting, thank like you. genuinely and very dynamic and innovative. So thank it's, you. It's been, I know, a huge pleasure as well for the city of Kingston to be able to collaborate with your organization. If, if you have time, yeah, you can yeah. also head downstairs to the exhibition itself. Sure. And maybe go sure. ask you some questions. Sure. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay. You. Thanks. Thank you.